Welcome back to our deep dive into crypto and Web3 at the Making Sense of Crypto and Web3 project. Uh, this is me, Rufus Pollock, and Stephen Deal, uh, who are hosting and running these deep dives in this particular section of the project. This week, in episode six, we're going to explore the interaction of climate change, public goods problems, and an example of an attempted solution to solve a public goods problem in the climate space using a decentralized autonomous organization, ClimaDAO. Just to give you a little background before we dive in, this, this exploration, which you can find online at web3.lifeitself.us, is looking into the phenomenon that is Web3, which has become massive with very bold claims made about its potential impact. Claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism of better or faster to claims for the radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. At the same time, there's an exceptional lack of agreement about these claims, or exceptional level of disagreement about them, even on basic points and definitions. This is an exceptionally controversial and polarizing topic with strong pro and anti camps. And significantly, disagreement cuts across classic ideological lines. This series is about helping you make sense of what is going on and to evaluate the key claims being made. We are starting by exploring specific hopes and aspirations and their associated ideologies. And we want to emphasize one key point of our approach. Throughout this series, we are seeking to steel man the various positions we come across. That is, we're trying to put the best version of the fools, whether they're uh, pro crypto and Web3 or Annie. We make the best version of those arguments and then we evaluate them. And we do that whether we agree or don't agree with the position. Take that into account as you listen. Let's begin then in our exploration today of this topic of public goods problems, climate and DAOs. And we're gonna look to make things helpful because there are quite a few different organization efforts in this space in the, the Web3 effort uh, endeavor. We're gonna look at one specifically that we have dug into in a little bit of detail, which is DAO, And we're gonna try and first of all, just set out our understanding of what DAO are doing. And we just acknowledge up front and we love correction obviously from anyone watching this episode or from DAO folks themselves, if we have misunderstood anything, we're gonna do our best effort for reading the white papers, reading online documentation to set up how they seek uh, to address the problem they're looking at uh, as best we can. And Stephen, do you want to set out just to begin with, and I don't know, let me know when you want to bring up the diagram, how you think we understand DAO is working and what the basic purpose is? Uh, so this is kind of the first like really concrete project that we've dived into this project. And we're going to kind of look at this centralized autonomous organization project on the merits of what their aspirations are according to um, the white papers and what the founders claim. Um, and from first principles, like climate DAO is an investment vehicle, which aims to give investors exposure to climate change offsetting ventures. Um, so effectively, according to their own words, it's the goal is to become a um, climate carbon-based reserve currency effectively like a semi-algorithmic central bank attached to like a decentralized governance structure. And the DAO serves the role of the kind of decentral bank, in their words, governing the monetary policy of this new carbon-backed currency, just as a central bank governs the monetary policy of a fiat currency. Um, over time, the founders want to build an economy around the climate currency by driving adoption and unlocking growth of the crypto carbon economy. Um, and it starts off with a very kind of bold claim that I think kind of goes to the kind of overarching philosophy of the entire project, which is that um, it's a statement about neoliberalism. Um, in our market economy, the invisible hand works to create prosperity and individual self-interest prevails. The freedom to produce and consume as we see fit generates value for the economy, value that allows for the whole of society to, to prosper. And we generally consider that the market is a rational and assume that it values things in a perfect way. And that's the, really the kind of overarching statement about the kind of economic philosophy of the founders of this project. Um, and I think it's a really good time to kind of pull up the diagram and kind of go through that because I think we should dive into like yeah. the actual mechanics of it. Yeah. And to emphasize, they are critiquing in some degree, and this is one of the interesting examples, this 
worked out that neoliberal philosophy. I mean, as they go on just to emphasize there, we ignore the paradox in front of us every day. Water a necessity of life is essentially free. Diamonds have no real utility, yet the free market, they are priced exorbitantly. This is the famous 19th century diamond water paradox. Um, strictly, um, this isn't a contradiction of the market because the market balances supply and demand. So it's not completely uh, utility or, or Marxian cost, um, you know, labor theory of value. But anyway, the, the, it's the point they making is a good one that value and price are disconnected visibly in our, our economy that we see today. And in the one way, this is one of these progressive DAOs, one that's very much um, looking to address something that seems dysfunctional, a classic almost critique of neoliberalism, yet using this kind of somewhat financialized model. And we're going to look into that. So I'm going to try and bring up our best understanding uh, so far of, um, of how that works. Of, of the kind of underlying model of climate now as an in kind of investment vehicle and to kind of walk through it as as we understand it. again i must admit that i i you know i'm not to say i i have a i have a peer you know i studied mathematics um to a graduate level i have a phd in economics uh, i taught economics at the university of cambridge uh you know i, I was an economist i i, I sometimes struggle at least for the first graph, sometimes to check the white papers that I read and, and to make sure that I haven't misunderstood something. But boil down to the essentials, um, this is what we understand the, uh, the model to, to be at the moment, which is someone comes along uh, with a dollar, a funch, essentially, or a euro or something. And you, first of all, you go and convert that into US, USDC, the kind of the stable coin equivalent of a US dollar. Um, on this leg here, first of all, and then um, uh, I hope then, and then we go down from the exchange to the Klima treasury. So essentially, and in exchange from depositing your, your some amount of USDC, I mean, it could have been more than that. You get one out of one divided by the price of Klima. I mean, or strictly you pay a certain amount of dollars and you get one Klima token back from the Klima treasury. And then what happens is that the Klima uh, organization, as it were, goes off takes the US dollar tokens that it has received, converts them back into dollars or euros or pounds and buys climate offset certificates um, over here on the right and which are out there traded on the, in some other market somewhere, but currently in euros, dollars, et cetera. And just to explain climate offsets, um, as we understand, again, it, I, I hope I haven't missed exact detail of this in the documents but essentially it's you know planting trees carbon sequestration technology potentially or carbon because there isn't actually any functional carbon sequestration really say other than trees and then there's methane capture and essentially the idea is that then one ton one ton certificate of carbon uh, climate carbon offsets or i should say carbon offset uh, i think here rather carbon uh, climate offset strictly uh, comes back into the treasury and the idea is as we understand it from the white paper there's a guarantee that every klima token that's issued is backed by at least one ton of carbon offsets um now what what you can see in this diagram in a simplified version essentially is we're converting dollars into tons of carbon off i mean essentially you're, you're you're taking money and you're buying carbon offsets um, and the one additional thing you're doing essentially is you get this Klima token. Um, you get the, the token back. What, I mean, I guess what one asks for oneself, it, you know, and if you think of any other model, you, you could think of the Klima token as a share. If I were just to go out and start an investment vehicle where I was gonna buy carbon offsets, I could just do this. I'd set up a company, people would invest money and I would go and buy carbon offsets. And I'd hold them in my company and I'd issue you a share in exchange for your investment, um, which, you know, is perfectly, perfectly uh, legitimate. It just wouldn't, it, it just wouldn't seem very innovative um, per se, um, maybe, but we can come to that. But it's just like, essentially, what we're doing is we're collecting money together and we're buying carbon offsets. Now, the one part, and I don't know uh, if Stephen can add to me here, is obviously you get this, you get this token and there is some kind of DeFi type stuff going on underneath it, which is, you know, we won't go into quite so much because we could talk about at some length if necessary, but seems to not change the basic model that 
that much of what's happening. Um, even if you can then stake your Klima or you can bond it or you can, you know, trade it for other things or whatever. Um, you can trade dollars or you can trade shares in a company for other things. I mean, these are all things you can do with a normal company. So just for now, that's that's sort of uh, yeah. Do you want to speak a bit more to this for the moment? Yeah. So any key points we want to bring out from our understanding of what's going on. I think you kind of enabled the whole thing. Like if you look at the most macro, like zoomed out version of this, it's basically equivalent to like a special purpose vehicle for buying carbon offsets from by taking dollars. And then on top of it, there's this kind of like um, Rube Goldberg machine that you can basically take those Klima shares or those tokens um, and sell them back to the treasury or create uh, derivative financial products on top of them, which could potentially give you more like shares in the entity itself. And those are called staking and bonding. So we could go into that in more detail, but it, it's kind it's of here nor there because it doesn't change the entire kind of macro structure of like what this entire thing is actually trying to do end to end. Um, it just adds a level for that people who are already invested in this thing to get more investment in it to basically. Yeah, I mean, to, to add the one question on it is, because this is quite common to many of these sort of DAO structures is, it's you could think of an analogy is like air miles or points on your credit card. There have been other times in, in, in financial history, like, you know, where people have sort of invented, like, you're going to go and buy, you know, an airplane ticket, but you're going to get, you're going to get the airplane ticket and you're going to get this kind of extra bonus of some kind. Um, you know, it, it, and this is the point here, sort of like the KlimaDAO token is both just simply a share, but I, maybe it's worth emphasizing the KlimaDAO or Klima, Klima tokens, at least at some point in their initial issuance, traded far above the intrinsic value of the carbon offset. Um, I mean, it's kind of a bit unclear at the moment. One of the things we've been struggling to work out is what the relationship is but when we did some of our analysis, and maybe again, we've missed that, of how much, uh, what difference there is. I mean, normally you might even try to discount to intrinsic values. For example, closed, closed in funds, frequently trade a, a discount to net asset value because of liquidity issues and so on. Um, but essentially you, you get, you've got the share, but it's somehow a share, an extra, it's not just like you've got your, your, your claim in the treasury. And this is a common thing that somehow this puff of deathly magic turns what is otherwise a simple special purpose vehicle for buying something um, into something much better. Um, and while obviously air miles have been popular and other examples like credit card points clearly work, they're sort of a minor, they're kind of pretty minor in the scheme of things. The major thing you do is you buy your airline ticket. There are examples and we can recommend this a wonderful New York Times article about the points guy. Um, he really got into the bit, you know, got into, you know, there's a lot of people who, some people have speculated in airline miles. It's kind of a minor sideshow. Um, and so let's kind of, if we wanted to come back is there anything else we want to we wanted to kind of cover on on our understanding of the Klima setup, um, where you know people investors post this kind of the USD you know basically posting a, a collateral of USDAC stable coins, <clears throat> you know, and and then we buy the carbon offsets. What we just showed that cycle. I mean, we want to maybe talk here about the more vanilla like that, but they have a dream as we just said at the very beginning of something being they're really becoming a global you know carbon based kind of reserve currency of some kind well there you know i think the current total is around 35 million dollars at the moment and it was much higher before they had their 99 percent um price crash um what we maybe could talk to an example we've looked up from which this kind of could aspire to be which is the ministry for the future of the future by kim stanley robinson do you want to talk a bit to that Stephen? yeah i think if we're going to kind of steel man this position i think um, this specific DAO project obviously has some sort of serious shortcomings, but I think there's a kind of um, idea, the, the, the platonic idea of building this kind of reserve currency uh, that could basically act as kind of a complementary currency to like the world's national currencies that could be used to basically do like targeted quantitative easing um, to encourage like either degrowth or decarbonization. Um, so in full, um, 
Michelle, I actually have not read this book. Um, I hear it's quite popular amongst the crypto crowd. Um, and basically the story of it is basically that um, in the future, there's this ministry that's set up that basically is going to uh, ensure the future of humanity by uh, both like geoengineering and financial engineering. And at the end of the book, they basically are able to kind of stave off climate change through a combination of those two. So it's basically a, a technocratic dream in which we save the world by you know, better engineering on both like the science and on the financial side. Um, so uh, Rufus has actually read the book. So maybe I should just let him kind of go into like the more details about yes. what actually happens. Yeah. Well, so I think, yeah, to, to, to talk here, the um, Kimmy Sang Rogers, who's obviously a really, you know, a ama- uh, kind of legendary science fiction novelist, wrote this, and I think it's it's also good to really acknowledge that it's one of the books that has one of the most kind of um, uh, so, so far maybe most realistic efforts to portray a climate future beyond pure dystopianism, beyond pure collapsing of the road and his other those other books. So I want to acknowledge, um, you know, he's a great author. In 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 this book, the Kind of core idea which relates to crypto and, and explicitly related to cryptocurrencies. I mean, it is described as a, a, a blockchain based project. Um, is this the, the, the world's central banks get together and sort of issue this carbon coin um, that the ministry gives out and, and kind of run by the Ministry of the Future that gives out for carbon sequestration? That it's a big project. That, sucks either co2 out of the air or doesn't actually emit co2 so you one of the other things in the book is you can kind of get the common coin just leaving your oil in the ground um at a rate of kind of one coin per ton so it's sort of like this this carbon backed or carbon sequestration backed uh currency or coin and oil companies get coins if they stop being oil companies basically leave being their assets in the ground for and specifically, this is quoting from the book, specifically a coordinated global round of quantitative easing through the issuance of a complementary currency called the carbon coin. The high discounted rate to the exchange for carbon capture is adopted. Carbon currency will be a debt-free revenue source with a predictable value, but will also require that each business that wants to earn the carbon currency must accept a long-term service level agreement. The service level agreement ensure that one unit of the carbon currency is issued for one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent that has been mitigated for a long time. So that's just a hundred year duration. Um, so, I mean, we, we the, the, the thing in the book is it, 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 um, it sounds sort of kind of uh, amazing. And it, 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 I mean, it, in the book, it, it works. I mean, it's sort of, it's, it is interesting. I just want to emphasize in the book that maybe unlike um, those who really like decentralization, it's basically run by the world central bank you could say in some way uh, something are distributed um whether they're decentralized you know what one could say but they it is coordinated and organized by them along with the ministry of the future um and there's there's obviously it has some relationship to most of the solutions suggested today anyway for climate change which is you know that there would be carbon budgeting essentially which would lead to a price and or value for carbon emission or carbon capture related to it um so i kind of want to emphasize that point which is like many of these stories often about crypto it's a little unclear at least when i read the book why why blockchain was needed um what you were describing it seems an essential part of of a climate addressing the climate crisis which is having some carbon budgeting system or some it, it was it, more this aspect of why the blockchain was needed and why you even needed this kind of currency as opposed to the traditional method of carbon budgeting but the the point is i think it, it what is interesting is it relates to this dream in which somehow um a carbon-backed currency um it plays a key role it's like somehow how we've harnessed technology and the market in, in unspecified ways and i think that's the as we come maybe a little bit to the critique here it's on it, it the, the, as like good science fiction it makes us think but it really requires us in these things to go from the science fiction to reality how how would that actually work why wouldn't the central banks issuing large amounts of new currency lead to like significant inflation as potentially is happening right now in the world where over the last few years, at least, there's been a growing concern about inflation even before recent events um, due to kind of quantitative easing going too far. And in the book, it's sort of assumed you could just do quantitative easing and there's no impact um, on the 
um, you know, real or nominal economy. So, um, you know, it, it's really unclear. It's really unclear, even in um, Kim and Robinson's case, both how it would work, but why blockchain is needed in the book. It, it, it's a cool new technology, but why it's actually relevant to creating the carbon coin. You know, you could you could just have the central bank saying we're willing to, you know, issue dollars to anyone who sequestrates carbon into the ground for a certain period of time. There's no requirement to create a crypto. And this apologies for the audience if you hear my young son in the background. Um, anything you'd like to add on that, Stephen? Yeah, I kind of agree with your analysis, Rufus. Like, I really racked my brain about like what the mechanism to actually build this kind of carbon coin would be. And it would be basically issuing this kind of like super national complementary currency that kind of acts like, I don't know, some sort of like special drawing rights or something or like, um, but it just keeps having up with like either like the quantitative easing problems, like money just doesn't work the way that like science fiction describes it working. Um, or the fact that like the governance problems associated with like who would oversee this thing? Why does it need a blockchain? And like, if the, if the answer to like most of the carbon problems in the world was that like we could just pay Exxon Mobile to cease existing and that would solve our problems, then I think we would have done that already. I think that's not really the answer to like, it's not, the world is not that simple. So I think Ultimately, I think the carbon coin thing is until I see like a white paper from the IMF kind of outlining explicitly how this would be done. I think it's kind of in the realm of science fiction at the moment. It's a cool idea, but it needs more spelling out of the specific details about this. What, but what we and what we can take from a Kim Nan Stanley Robinson, at least from Kim Nan Robinson's example uh, in the book, uh, if I'm doing it justice. Um, is that it does really involve collective action. It does involve these central banks in the book coming together. And that's hard. In the book, it's described the, the, the woman who leads the ministry of the future. It's a real struggle. It's not an easy process to bring together these, this group of people to coordinate on some new action. And that's, that, I think, is the most kind of realistic and impressive part of that story, in a way, which is it, it shows major governments coming together to solve, in a way, at least part of the climate crisis. Rather than the technology, it's that piece of social, uh, I don't know the use of the word engineering, it's a piece of social uh, action, that part of um, uh, collective action that's really powerful and important. And that will bring us, as, as we kind of come back here a little bit, to first of all, to a little bit of a critique, but we wanted today to kind of take the, the, the aspirations of Klimadao or even of that and talk a little bit about public goods problems in a moment. So first of all, just though, to talk about Klima, to kind of having steel man to the best extent we can as like a special purpose vehicle for investing in uh, essentially carbon uh, offsets or carbon sequestration with some kind of DEFI, you know, like um, point system tacked on the side. Um, the, what are some of the challenges that we, we've seen of, you know, the clean token as a point system perhaps both saw an incredible uh, rise, I think, uh, if I know correctly, topped out somewhere uh, at the beginning of its, of its process uh, at, over, at over kind of uh, over $3,000. At its height, I think it was about three thousand six hundred dollars was that the kind of top point of Prima's price, which obviously was well above the intrinsic value of one ton of carbon, but since has uh, collapsed. I mean, I think today, uh, if I check, it's trading around twenty dollars. Um, so it's lost ninety nine percent of its value. To be fair, we should allow for the fact that it's 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 a token that sort of has this kind of compounding, or if you, if you hold it and you stake it, you get some quite a quite incredible rate of interest but nevertheless um 99 reduction in kind of the 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 token in value over time is, is quite substantial quite substantial volatility um do you want to say anything more about that or the other kind of aspects of, of the klima setup that one might critique uh steven yeah this is what i really struggle with because like it keeps using the word kind of this aspires to be like a reserve currency and like, like words have meaning and like a reserve currency is something that basically a large group of people on like an international scale adopt because, you know, goods and services of their major trading partners are denominated in the currency. Um, and so like when I read this, this white paper and I see the word reserve currency being used all over the place, number one, 
Um, the insane price volatility of this thing means it can't really function as a currency, just like a lot of other crypto assets can't. Um, and the notion that it could be a reserve currency when nobody's denominating any kind of goods or services, and it seems to be kind of an inherent, like irreconcilable contradiction in this thing. So like, um, you know, the, the aspiration of building this kind of algorithmic central bank that kind of self-balances itself uh, is a very interesting idea. It's just, I don't see that <laughs> being what's here actually in practice. And like a lot of other crypto projects, it seems to be kind of a piece of financial engineering that at the bottom sits kind of a, an appeal to a narrative and a faith that kind of this number is going to go up by kind of creating this kind of pool of artificially scarce digital assets. But that's the exact opposite of like a currency. That's not the kind of behavior you want. And I mean, you can create all of this kind of different levels of obfuscation on top of that and all this kind of financial engineering. But fundamentally, if the foundation of the thing as a kind of indirect special purpose vehicle for getting shares doesn't make sense, then I think there's a fundamental problem baked into the entire design. And at least as far as I understand the entire structure of it today. Um, and so that's the kind of problem I see with the entire kind of financial engineering project of it. Yeah, and to add to that, I mean, just to explain, at a basic level, if what we're trying to do is efficiently, uh, you know, if you take the aspiration behind the project, which I understand, either it's this kind of really big vision, I mean, you might have of the Kimberley say Robson, but even a basic level, it might just be, we want to buy carbon offsets, we want to, we want to sequestrate carbon, we want to plant more trees, and we want to drive up the price of, of carbon offsets, as we buy more of them, there'll be less supply, that will make it more expensive to kind of pollute, etc., um, or to, to create carbon, which seems an amazing aspiration. But then you'd want to do that in the most effective and efficient way possible. And at least here, if you are creating a special purpose vehicle for buying carbon offsets, there are really significant exchange fees here. You, you are essentially converting dollars into crypto and then converting crypto back into dollars to buy carbon offsets and then hold them on your blockchain based on Ethereum, which has quite high transaction fees. I mean, it's not, we haven't really been able to back out or understand uh, yet for ourselves reading the documentation or the published information. I'm not saying it isn't transparent. I'm just saying we haven't found it yet. Um, what those management fees are, like what the transaction costs are. But one would have to guess just for every dollar going in, you, you're not able to buy even close to a dollar, you know, of, of carbon offset certificates, given the exchange fees and other, other stuff you're having to run. So it just seems like quite inefficient and just a basic level of what it's trying to do. And that, the only thing that makes it kind of exciting is this kind of the speculative part here by having the Pima tokens, which can have this, you know, incredible price uh, volatility. Somehow we can, we can raise a lot of money, but even there you'd say, well, why not just raise the money at the beginning, you know, almost shut down the thing and just buy carbon offsets and, and just hold it. Um, why, why not just buy carbon offsets directly? It's just really, at least for me, maybe um, the, the, the traditional economist me, I'm just really struggling to kind of work out where the where where that works even if the aspiration is a really beautiful one isn't there a better way to fulfill on that aspiration of let's just buy carbon offsets directly um so i think that that's a kind of point and it, it and i think there's a kind of related it's the kind of obfuscation for me i don't quite um there's a lot of stuff in, in the Klima and it kind of relates to a project called Olympus that we won't go into so much today, um, which these kind of algorithmic stable coins, but there's a lot of game theory. I mean, you'll even see this on the, on, if you're into crypto uh, on the web, people with this kind of like double brackets, you know, um, three, three or infinity, infinity, um, referring to payoffs in the game theoretic structure of the prison's dilemma or some other cooperative game. And what they're referring to is something really important, which is how do we, how do we find cooperative solutions? such as around climate change versus the kind of, um, you know, non-cooperative solutions, which lead to kind of bad outcomes. That seems a really, really worthy point, um, a really worthy inquiry. It just, it's just a bit of a mystery, often in reading these white papers, it, it, like how that actually happens. I, I, I'm often really intrigued with being like, wow, they're dealing with these really crucial questions of human co cooperation and institutional design. And then it's just like, how? Like, it, it just kind of seems to be like, oh, this, there's a kind of gap and again I think this is one thing to critique it's just the obfuscation I'm not sure it's intentional almost accidental in the white papers or other pieces of documentation how these mechanisms work and why the defi part is required why do we need all the stake 
networking and bonding and other stuff, which seems to be kind of like almost add to the obfuscation of the underlying purpose. Um, so, you know, and, 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 you know, I just want to kind of say a flag for me is that the risk otherwise is people could see that that, I, I think it could be seen that that kind of obfuscation is actually um, kind of, um, I wouldn't say intentional, but part of what is allowing the system to function that, that, um, it's by making things super complicated, people don't understand that really it, it's kind of the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. You know, there's, there is no magic. Um, and that, given that's a risk in at least in other areas, I don't, just to emphasize, it seems like the Klima project is really in good faith. There are other DAO projects or other Web3 projects, obviously, which, have, which are some of quote unquote rug pulls or scams and partly rely on this sort of obfuscation of what's going on to lure in unsuspecting investors and give the whole field a bad name. So I think it's incumbent on good faith actors, such as Klima to be as clear in their communication, as transparent in their explanation uh, as they can be. And that that's not also totally the case, at least for me, maybe I'm just struggling in this space that I'm not as familiar with. Um, another point is the governance point, which is a big point of DAOs. And, and just to make a comment here, uh, maybe you, Stephen, you want to talk to is it's not um, basically, the, the government tokens are viable basically on the open market in the sense that they are associated with the, the tokens you get issued, which obviously presents a risk to bad actors. That's another question we were just wondering about. Do you want to emphasize kind of point? Yeah, I think because as like kind of adversarial case, we'll just kind of think about in kind of extreme scenarios. It's like since the governance tokens are basically purchasable by, by any actor, um, you know, what's up basically like Exxon Mobile? like a, basically a large petrol company for basically just going and buying up all of the governance tokens in such an entity and then basically taking over control of the management structure, right? Just like you would kind of do like a hostile takeover of like a board or something, right? And, um, you know, ultimately that ultimately still depends on, you know, a bunch of people to basically make the final decision about like what the direction of this thing is going to be doing instead of the decentralized autonomous organization. So then basically you're still back to the same kind of governance structure that we use in real life today, which point in the DAO structure is entirely, you know, illusory in the first place, right? And, you know, fundamentally, I just can't get over the fact that like, as an individual, you could just go straight to the market and buy the carbon offsets using dollars that they would go buy, you know, indirectly through this fund structure. And so like, you don't need to go through this hyper volatile speculative asset with all of these like, you know, $600 a pop Ethereum transaction fees and like this whole DAO in direction layer just to buy carbon offsets. You could buy carbon offsets with dollars today and without this kind of extreme premium on top of it to kind of give rise to this entire, you know, structure that seems to serve little if any purpose. And that's the biggest issue I see with the whole structure as I see fit. The next point, I think, just for Kleeman, I think it's a point generally uh, in this space, is about scale. Um, the total market cap we mentioned earlier is around, at the moment, it's around uh, $35 million. Uh, um, even if it were 10 or, or 100 times that, compared to the amount being spent in the climate space, you know, it, it just seems really small. Um, there are 53 tr trillion uh, euros in assets under management in the ESG space. Of course, not all of that is related to climate. There's a large amount of philanthropic money. There are states spending money. Um, one question that comes up is how would these, these, these kind of innovative models actually get to kind of state scale? You know, and some answers can be like, of course, something starts small. You know, you, you know what use is a baby is the famous comment of Faraday to Gladstone about uh, a demonstration of electricity you know like you have to imagine what it will become but one needs to distinguish between plausible evolutions like that and things which there are public goods problems how do we and we're about and we're going to talk about that more in a moment but how do we ensure contribution at the scale that we want and it's not clear uh to me it's not even clear in the kim stanley robertson case really um, how that was solved, other than in fact by state actors. In Kim Stanley Robinson case, it was the central banks who are, you know, supported, created by large states. Um, the Ch Chinese central bank plays a central role, for example, in the Kim Stanley Robinson example, along with the US. Um, 
it's already clear how do we get to the scale that we need. So while you might just say, of course, this is just Klima is at the beginning of its journey and it, you know, it may in 20 years be massive. There's not really a very clear narrative or even hypothesis about how it goes from kind of something funded by the crypto border bubble, essentially, um, or, you know, and smaller than even most philanthropic kind of fund efforts around climate, climate change, to something that would really um, get to the scale that they seem to aspire to. Um, again, that's not critiquing the great aspiration there, but it's, it is thinking about given all the energy that goes there, it could have gone into something else. It could have, the money could have just been gone and used to um, buy carbon offsets directly. And um, I think this is a point that, you know, also in there, which is, I think, actually crucial. And we even, uh, and maybe you could talk to you, but this is also something fundamental about this method of, of solution of the climate crisis, institutional action. It's, it's essentially kind of um, technologically oriented in, in, in some sense. It's both in terms of what it's buying, which is the carbon offsets. It's buying climate credits have a big problem. Um, you know, maybe you want to talk to this a little bit. Yeah, so climate offsets and climate credits um, are not without a certain amount of like both sides of debate about whether this is actually an effective mechanism because, um, you know, buying these kind of offsets is basically like a form of people criticize it being like a form of indulgence where you pay for the right to pollute the environment by paying off the damage via some sort of future project that will kind of offset the amount of carbon you emit. Um, and so like, you're not actually solving the problem, you're just kind of trying to mitigate it. So instead of trying to like put out the fire, you're just saying like, well, let, let's just like, you know, cut down the trees around the fire so it doesn't spread, you know? Um, it doesn't actually fix the root mechanism, which is that we're fact we're burning fossil fuels and that's emitting so much CO2. So unfortunately what we've seen, at least in some of these carbon credits, um, is that people will kind of exploit these mechanisms to maximize their capacity to pollute. Um, and that when we have secondary markets for these carbon credits, they become game just like any other market would be. Um, so Tesla, for instance, has made a lot of money kind of on a secondary market selling carbon credits, um, not because of their offsetting, because they can you know, manipulate certain aspects of the market to do um, the normal financial tricks we see in markets today. And so um, climate credits, at least among people that I know in like um, in the ecology space, um, definitely have a sort of like, um, they're better than nothing, but they're not necessarily this kind of silver bullet that people think they are to kind of address the climate change problem because only thing that will do that is kind of scaling back on emissions and carbon credits don't scale back on emissions, they just try to mitigate them. And I think that really kind of goes to like a common theme that we see across a lot of the Web3 initiative is that like, you know, it's techno solutionism be the financialization of everything. And so we're gonna turn the abstract idea of fighting climate change into kind of a fictitious commodity that can be traded on the market. And at this point, we're actually like two levels of indirection now. Like we have the carbon credits, which are also kind of a, a fiction. Uh, and then we have another financial product on top of that, which is the climate token. And then we have this kind of like um, DeFi financialization on top of the climate token. So you're like three levels of indirection away from actually doing anything in the physical world at this point. And just like we talked about in last week's episode about like financial engineering, uh, it's not clear that, you know, creating all of this additional complexity and all of this additional financialization on top of you know, just planting trees is actually getting more trees planted. Um, and it may actually be a distraction from actually just planting the trees or buying or doing emissions reduction in the first place because all this financial engineering seems to be kind of uh, an additional level of complexity for um, you know, a proposition that seems at least questionable. I, I think that's really crucial is that essentially there is no, what we would suggest is there's no financial silver bullet that these things, the real, real risk is they end up as distractions from actual solutions. Um, they, and, and even a net negative, not only are they distraction, they absorb time, money, emit more, you know, more, more pollution in, because we're running on proof of work and so on. And, it, it, you know, the, the thing that we could look at is that, you know, Mark Carney, the ex-governor of the Bank of England, proposed at COP26 to allocate 130 trillion to help address solutions to climate change. You know, 
anything we can actually do, we can afford. The, the money exists. The problem is doing supranational coordination of solutions and allocating resources to these projects. It's people agreeing to contribute um, to something, to take action. Um, unfettered capitalism is the process of commoditizing everything, you know, privatizing commons and destroying that which is no value and converting everything into private profit. And the weird thing is, it sounds a lot like what Klimadal said in their manifesto. So there's kind of, in a way, this agreement, but weirdly, it then kind of goes down the route of like, um, let's be struggling to understand this. The aspiration seems really uh, beautiful. The, the general even kind of initial manifesto resonates a lot with the critique of what doesn't work about kind of unfettered capitalism, about unfettered market system, uh, the lack of provision for public goods. And yet it seems to then go further down that route. And it's at this point, we want to talk a little bit in general about climate, uh, climate and public goods problems, because I think it would help quite a bit in the climate space. And I'm going to share our screen while we explain a little bit here about uh, that. Um, so one of the things is, you know, there's some, let's say there's, there's some public good in this case we could think of. Um, you could, you know, we could consider many uh, here, but we could think of our public good. It could be, it could be the swimming pool. Uh, it could be the, the sea. Uh, it, it could be the atmosphere, carbon-free atmosphere. It could be also software, um, you know, open source software. There are many things we could think about. And the basic logic of all these problems, I think people understand, is that people have to contribute. And then if everyone contributes, we get something back. Um, you know, the, and the problem is I have an incentive to not contribute and just get the, the return. Um, but the problem is if enough people do that, then the whole thing if enough people stop contributing, the whole thing disappears. That's the, uh, the problem. Now, what often happens is, is there's some model where we're contributing and obviously then money, it, just to kind of, this is the overall good, but if we were to do it a bit more subtly, money's gonna come out of the treasury. People can contribute to this treasury. And I think just one thing I wanna emphasize in my experience of, of discussions here um, is maybe people are all coming into paying for this public good. So I'm gonna kind of have this as both being the public good and then you know, spend, spend, like if, if we're strictly doing it, there's a kind of, people are actually spending, there's actually the public good is actually, let's just say it's linked over here. And this is the public good fund. Yeah, just to really clarify. And so strictly, this kind of comes back from over here. These come from over here. This comes from over here. And what happens is we're gonna spend, we're gonna spend money on some kind of activity um, here. Uh, I'm just going to put it so it's going to be like some kind of activity we're going to do. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to plant trees. We're going to plant trees. We're going to build a swimming pool, whatever. And that leads to the public good. I, I just want to distinguish these things because one of the things that comes up a lot in, in, in my experience in, in kind of crypto type discussions is a bit of confusion between this part of people giving money in and the governance mechanism by which money is allocated. So there's a bunch of allocation choices here. Yeah. Um, for example, we need to choose what pro projects to fund with the money that we've raised in taxes or that we put into a given fund for some public good. And then that's going to lead to these public goods getting created, um, you know, and, and so on. Now, the issue that, that comes up, and it's worth talking about it, is there's those two problems, this is the collective action problem up here, or what is otherwise known as the free rider problem. And this is a kind of, um, well, a decision-making problem. What projects should be fun? What open software should we build? What swimming pool or other community um, spaces should we create? Um, how do we clear the sea of plastics? How do we uh, prevent carbon emissions or sequester carbon? And this problem relatively is quite easy, uh, relatively. Uh, it doesn't mean it's an easy choice, but we actually have quite a lot of mechanisms existing for addressing how we allocate funds that we have collectively run. That we have the state, we have, collect we have democratic decision makings, we have X factor, we have um, you know, how we allocate money in academia, we have... Um, all kinds of ways of voting or assigning money uh, to, to things once we've collected it. And these problems are related. Obviously, if I'm in a system with an extremely undemocratic or 
uh, dictatorial way of allocating money, I might be less willing to contribute to the fund in the first place. But this is the hard problem. This is this this is this is the really big issue. This issue over here, and one of the things that often comes up around DAOs and wicked problems that I've heard is there's a lot of attention paid on this. If, if people are in the DAO space or, or the Web3 space, they've probably heard of quadratic voting. They've probably heard of how DAOs have innovation in that space. But it doesn't really have a lot of relation to don't contribute. How, how do we stop? You know, if, if Stephen over here, if this was Stephen in the diagram, decides not to contribute, why, what, and I see him not contributing, why am I not then going to not contribute? And before we know it, the whole thing has collapsed. How do we deal with, with people who aren't contributing? And often this is kind of a little bit how that will solve it. And it's not, that isn't really to solve it at all. The mechanisms we have in, in, in we've built up over hundreds and thousands of years through states often rely bluntly put on force. Um, they rely in, in the positive sense, it might be, but we all agree, I mean, we might say we have a social contract, but we all agree that if we don't pay our taxes, we can be put in jail. Um, I think the libertarians out there might have a lot of, or well, the anarchists might have a big point to make that that's, that's a, a, a not a very, a very simplified or even inaccurate view of the state. The state is, is actually kind of abusive or parasitic. But one, at least one version is that something has to enforce this. And there's often these visions of we can have sort of libertarian solutions to the collective action problem. And I, I personally would love that. Uh, I'm sure I think Stephen would love that. I think other, anyone in the world would love to have um, kind of fully volunteer, voluntary, as it were, um, solutions to collect that problem, but they don't seem to exist. We build, uh, we build walls around our swimming pools and we charge for entry or we, we put a limit on entry to the people who contributed to building the swimming pool um, because otherwise people would just come along your swimming pool and they want to contribute to it. In that case, why should I bother contributing in the first place? Um, so this is a really, and that is what faces us in the climate crisis right now. Put very simply, governments have to commit to reduce the amount of carbon they emit. That's the simple, in this case, it's almost a not, not to put money in, it's to not do something. But in a way, it's to spend money to not do something, to, to, to have a cost to the economy of not uh, burning oil, not burning gas, not burning coal. They have to agree to make those kind of contributions. And that's hard to do. We're asking, for example, uh, different countries around the world to, you know, India to limit its emissions while the US has much higher per capita emissions. How do you resolve those tough questions? How do you uh, have countries choose to uh, maybe limit their material growth? Well, some of them certainly are still materially quite, these are not impossible to solve, uh, successfully overcome collective action problems of all kinds, um, but it, it isn't straightforward by any means. I don't know, Stephen, if there's anything you want to add on that for the moment. Yeah, I think yeah. you did a really great description of that. So Rufus actually wrote a whole book called like The Open Revolution, which I think at the heart of it is kind of a lot of it's about like kind of the free rider problem. And I think the area that we both kind of intersect in is that both of us have a, a background in open source software, uh, which is very much a kind of public goods problem. It's a space where we have like the magnificent kind of transnational leaderless collaborations on these amazing technical endeavors of like staggering complexity, things like the Linux kernel or like, you know, uh, NumPy or like the internet or like this amazing amount of software. And I think I can't overstate this enough is that like a lot of these pieces of software are written by like one person. And it's like the equivalent of like if an entire country was basically being fed by like one farmer, like the scale and the reach of some software is if it like, you know, one person was feeding an entire nation. Um, software has this kind of exponential kind of return on certain public goods. Uh, but it also has this kind of absolute tragedy of the commons problem um, that, you know, we, we have a name for it. We call it the Nebraska problem, named after this famous kind of XKCD cartoon in which basically this like edifice of like software architecture is resting on this one small little block. And the subtitle is like a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. Yeah, exactly. That's the one. And like, this is the probably the purest example of like the free rider problem is that like all of our internet depends on this tiny little brick holding up this massive edifice. And if that one person were to kind of, you know, pass away or, you know, get hit by a bus, then like the entire edifice of like all of digital infrastructure, all modern digital infrastructure just collapses over. And I think to me, this is kind of the purest illustration of like, the free rider problem, at least as it exists in public, in software. And like 
every day software engineers have to struggle with the fact that like we take too much from the public sphere and we don't give enough back. And it's not clear that there's actually a mechanism by which we could fund this stuff because large corporations don't seem generally keen on contributing back to open source software. They only seem keen on taking. And the same kind of problem, uh, you know, it basically is done on a much grander scale with the climate change problem. And, you know, like even this, like the Web3 sense making project that me and Rufus are doing is basically a public good. Like we're basically just doing this kind of basically just, you know, put information out there without expecting anything in return. And so like, you know, this just manifests everything we do around us. Like when we do it for like, you know, the good of civilization or humanity, like, you know, we have to be able to do these things in a sustainable way. Uh, otherwise we end up with these mm -hmm. uh, hard problems, wicked problems. And, and to emphasize that, I mean, one is that has happened with internet. I mean, there's obviously the Heartbleed uh, failure, which was really famous. There's more recently been the, the log, uh, Log4j uh, issue. Um, so these, these are really, uh, and, and to maybe emphasize, there are, uh, there are plausible um, uh, solutions or at least plausible hypotheses for addressing them. I mean, I, not to, I don't wanna do it, but my, my book, which is also free and open source online, Open Revolution, uh, goes into some detail in talking through a mechanism for funding, for example, uh, software goods, uh, information, you know, movies, music, uh, we have examples and we have examples that we could plausibly scale. Uh, we also have examples of funding informational public goods, at least at incredible scale, and even efforts around, uh, around the environment. Uh, you know, governments spend billions, trillions in combination a year on uh, international research and development. Most of, um, you know, all of modern computing, all of, all of modern medical science, all of modern mathematics basically was publicly good funded in some way by governments or through other mechanisms, pretty much. So we have got in, we have got incredible examples. What we would emphasize, at least on this, or I would like to emphasize, is mostly they have gone via states. Mostly, um, the way we've done that is we've created like club. If people know what club goods, it's just like we get together to you know fund a local swimming pool. But if it's kind of done by a group of people, there might be some limit, you know, on 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 your usage um, to the people who actually contributed. So similarly, the state is like the largest version of that. And it, it comes with some oppressive characteristics, obviously, um, that it can compel you to pay taxes. And, and in many cases is more oppressive than that. But we haven't really found a, a, a mechanism much better than that. And I know it's a, it's a dream, I think, both for myself personally, but of many people in the crypto and web three space, or at least those behind these more progressive projects of how, uh, there's a real dream that that could be done in both, we could both scale public, public goods funding or collective action scale without compulsion in some way. That is to me yet yeah, unproven. Anything you would like to add on that, Stephen? Yeah, um, I think this kind of segue into our next section here is that I think when we start talking about um, solutions to the free rider problem um, with regards to climate change. Uh, I think the big part of the issue I have with these kind of techno solutionist perspectives uh, is that the urgency of the time scale of the climate change crisis requires us to kind of engage solutions using existing institutions. Like there's kind of no other choice. Like we're kind of coming down to like, this is like kind of the last decade by which some of the really wicked problems around climate change have to be addressed. And, you know, these kind of uh, solutions to addressing the free rider problem are not mutually incompatible with compelling our institutions to behave differently and seeking to change them from within. So this is very much kind of a reformist perspective. Like we need to basically affect change from within inside of our institutions instead of like burning everything down and replacing it with DAOs. And, you know, just kind of like speak on a more kind of more solutionist perspective about like what, like at least what I think personally is kind of a better path toward looking at climate change is that like, I think, you know, this is like Rufus said, this is gonna involve some aspect of the state. It's gonna involve reclaiming public money and putting that money towards the sustenance of public goods. And like, for me, there's kind of this big kind of elephant in the room is it's kind of, we have this like hundred trillion dollar shadow banking system that's currently being used by like a lot of plutocrats to like evade taxes and kind of strangle our democracies. And like, if we could onshore that capital, 
redistribute that toward public interest, fund R&D, do public works development, develop things like, you know, fusion research and more solar cells and green infrastructure, do the kind of relocations we need with the rising sea levels and just doing the international development to, you know, prepare ourselves for um, the world as it's going to be, um, then, you know, that to me seems like a far more effective solution. And where I have a big issue with this with crypto is that crypto seems to be enabling a lot more of the shadow banking system to exist. And there's like really uh, influential scholars like Ann Pettifor and Hillary Allen have noted that like, you know, crypto is a mechanism by which we can offshore more money, evade more taxes and allow plutocrats to strangle democracy to an even greater degree. And to me, like that to me is the kind of really profound problem um, with using crypto to kind of solve climate change problems is that it seems to be kind of working in the other direction simultaneously. And so this kind of $35 million climate DAO that kind of indirectly buys, you know, um, carbon offsets at a huge premium to me seems like largely a distraction and at worst kind of a mechanism by which we escalate the very conditions that give rise to the political and economic stagnation that we see um, that gives rise to climate change in the in the first place. And like, to me, private money is not the answer because private money has no capacity to kind of be used as a widespread medium of exchange. And so to me, this is the fundamental problem with the carbon coin problem. Like its incentives are at best kind of local and not global. And we need global solutions to address wicked, hard, civilizational level problems. And I think ultimately the kind of left-wing perspective on this is like the only answer we really have is that like climate um, collective action problems can only be solved by kind of um, toning back on uh, the excesses of capitalism um, and, you know, funding more things through the state and doing big works projects and using the state as a means to affect change on a supranational level. And to me, this seems like there's no other option. That simply is the, the mechanism we have to go or we face some very dire consequences in the future. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I mean, ultimately, tackling climate change, you know, whether you're from, I think from the left or the right, from a religious perspective, tackling climate change requires humanity to become wiser and more economically literate about the free rider problem. It requires new ways of thinking about economic growth and a different ontological perspective about our shared humanity in relation to our children's future. Um, these root, you know, in, in our perspective at least, these answers cannot be rooted in a more extreme form of neoliberalism. Um, neoliberalism, why we have climate change and why our political system is paralyzed to address the scale of the large tragedy of the commons problems. And ultimately, we need to imagine a radically different system. And I think that's something that one can see in the aspiration of many uh, Taoists. Web3, let's, let's, let's take that energy, but let's connect it with practical utopianism and gaining control over our existing institutions, engaging with them with, with political action or other ways. There is no alternative to that. There is no way forward. There's no magic side, you know, kind of um, shortcut. Um, that will that through you know I don't know through some puff of blockchain it will allow us to solve those hard collective action problems, other than the, that that kind of work. And that leaves us here for this episode. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, listeners. And we look forward to joining us on our next episode in two weeks. All the very best. Take care. Cheers.